all those above me that watch over me, to all of you, my faith para peeps on this side of the veil, welcome. This is Reverend Sean Whittington's Paranormal Ministry. I'm your host, Reverend Sean, the Rev. Welcome to my haunted house, my very haunted house. And uh, it could get active. Uh, it's been active today, and it could have something to do with my guest, which I'm going to bring on here very shortly, and you're going to love her. What else do I want to tell you guys? Thank you all for tuning in. I don't have a show without you guys, so God bless you all for that. Uh, the prayer urn. Let's do the prayer urn today. It's back. It took last week off for Halloween because I had a prayer pumpkin, which was cool. But let's see who's in the prayer urn today. Okay. Brian B. This is a good one. I'm glad I pulled Brian. I ask you guys all the time to pray for my former, current, and future students that are taking my Introduction to Spiritual Warfare course. Brian happens to be one of my students. Lifelong paranormal experiencer, very religious, very spiritual person, great guy. Happens to be very gifted at performing minor deliverances, and he's done many, many of them, and brought to situ many situations like that to closure. There's something a lot of you may not know about us in this field of deliverance ministry. We're always under attack. All of us have a wanted poster of us hanging up in hell. Having said that, we're all human, and sometimes things just catch up on you. You see one client after another, after another, after another, all de dealing with these malevolent, malevolent issues, excuse me. Uh, it can get to you, and it can get to you, and you don't even realize it's getting to you, along with the subtle attacks, uh, people really close to you having issues, life happening. Next thing you know, you're very depressed. You go through several, a whole string of clients you're not able to help for whatever reason, and so at times you start doubting your faith or questioning your faith, if you will. So that's where Brian's at at the time. Brian, if you're watching, buddy, I got a wonderful prayer for you, and I'm going to email it to you after the show, but listen to the words if you're watching to this prayer and everyone else out there for this prayer. If you want to add any positive love and light to this prayer for Brian while I'm saying it, just reach out, touch your computer screen, close your eyes, bow your head, and um, we'll get going. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O oh God, send forth your Holy Spirit into my heart that I may perceive, into my mind that I may remember, and into my soul that I may mediate. Teach, guide, and direct my thoughts and senses from beginning to end. May your grace ever help and correct me, and may I be strengthened now with wisdom from on high for the sake of your infinite mercy. Amen. And you guys know the rule. Everybody gets a candle. Brian, this candle is for you, brother. It will burn with me here and enjoy the show. And after the show, I will put it in the room with all the other candles burning for people. It'll burn until it burns out. Until then, may the Holy Spirit enter and intervene in your life and remain with you on the remainder of this journey and on to the next. Amen. Okay, if there's anything you want to know about me and my wife and our ministry work, go to our website, www.ghost-b-gone.biz. If you go to visit the website and you notice the donate button and you're able to do so, click on it and send in a small donation. My wife and I don't charge for our ministry work, helping people with their paranormal issues. So, Donations are greatly appreciated from the bottom of our heart, and we, we put that money to good use, I assure you. 
In addition to being an ordained exorcist, I'm also a certified spiritual advisor, intuitive coach. If you're having issues of a spiritual nature not attached to the paranormal and you'd like to speak to the Rev about that, there's a place there on the website that you can make an appointment with me. But don't leave the website without navigating over to the page called the WSE course slash book. On that page, you'll find the ghost store. I challenge you to find something in there that you don't think is cool that you want to purchase. I have had nobody ever knock on my door and throw anything back at me that they bought online on my website. Uh, So that's the good news. A lot of cool stuff on there if you go for that sort of stuff. But scroll down a little bit further and you'll run into my new haunted autobiography, God, Ghosts, and the Paranormal Ministry. And I quote the scariest book I ever published. That was Annette Munich, owner of Stellium Books, my publisher. Please don't let that scare you off from buying a copy of it. It's a very different kind of feel-good story. A lot of good versus evil where good wins. But if you haven't done your good deed for the day yet, purchase a copy. You can get it a little less expensive at Amazon, but you can also get it on the website autographed by yours truly. And it comes in cl- enclosed in a uh, house blessing kit, which is very cool. But the really cool thing is part of the proceeds of every sale of every copy of the book goes to support stjude.org and St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, Nevada. And that's a beautiful thing. And I added a new uh, charity to that. I've been in the animal care industry most of my adult life, so this was a no-brainer. I added the ASPCA, so you get to help the animals a little bit too. That's cool. All righty, what else do I want to tell you guys? Worldwide Society of Exorcists you'll find on that page. I'm the founding member. I offer a 12-week online course, Introduction to Spiritual Warfare, through the WSE. That's a course for all of you warriors for Christ out there that are feeling a hunger and a true calling to want to have more knowledge when it comes to drawing your line in the sand, making a stand, circling the wagons, and putting up a good fight against, God forbid, true evil if it ever comes calling. That's the course for you. All of my students that graduate get a stunning diploma, certificate of completion, suited for framing, it's beautiful, along with some very special blessed parting gifts that you can only get from yours truly, the Rev. You can enroll in the course there at the website, or if you'd like to read more about it before making that type of commitment, there is a Worldwide Society of Exorcists Facebook page. And you can go there and read a little bit more about the course. Most importantly, please keep all of my past, current, and future students in your prayers. Thank you very much. Okay. Now is the time, because of all you guys tuned in for this. You didn't tune in for me. I know that. I'm so excited to have her here. She is a lifelong paranormal experiencer, paranormal authority, medium, very gifted medium. You all know her. You all love her. Co-host of The Outer Realm with Michelle De Roche and Amelia. Pisano. Brothers and sisters, please give a wonderful paranormal ministry welcome to the one and only Amelia Pisano. Amelia, are you with us? I'm here. Hi, how are you? Thank I you for having me. Great. I am a blessed person. And how I know that is because you're oh here. Oh my gosh, no. Thank you. I, I am so honored to be here. I don't get this opportunity too often. <laughs> I don't have the time to fit in, so your time slot is perfect. Thank that you. Works, and that I, works. And I hear really good things about you from Michelle. So. Uh-oh. And yeah. earlier today, you had a you, you posted a promo for the show. You called me, was it a fabulous fellow? Fabulous fella, <laughs> yeah. I, am, I don't think anybody's ever get, slapped me with the, with the double F. <laughs> the double left before, so I love that. Yeah, so but you look good. very pretty today. How do you okay. feel? Okay, so do you. I'm feeling okay. It's the end of the week, but I'm still working tonight. So, you know, we work all the time, but I'm good. How are you? I'm hanging in there. You are up north in Canada, correct? I'm southern Ontario. So I'm I'm, I'm just 
about 45 minutes north of Buffalo. So I'm really not that far up north. <laughs> north um, for you. <laughs> what is, are the borders open yet? Yes. How they have They've been, been open for a while. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, how the last year and a half, we all wish we could have done a do-over. How have you done throughout the whole pandemic, COVID thing, and everybody that's close to you that you love? How's everyone doing? It was a tough one. I lost my father a year ago oh at the end gosh. of this month. And um, it was tough. It, it was hard. Like everybody, we're, we're yeah. all um, coping. And it was hard because, I mean, he lived a good 90 years thank god and he used to always say to me if i could live 90 years i'll be happy <laughs> so i know he got his wish i lost my mom when i was young so this was a different type of loss and i cared for him which was was tough you know with dementia and stuff like that but it was a tough year because of the closures not being able to visit him and not being able you know to go in and just the video calling and sometimes that's not enough. When they're suffering with Alzheimer's or dementia, you have to be really there all the time, yeah. you know, and, and absorb everything you can. But it's been, a, it's been tough like it is for everyone being locked down, but there's a lot of blessings that have come out of it. You know, you, you get to spend more time with your immediate family. You, you're talking more, you're, you know, you're communicating more. You're, I'm, I'm blessed for that, I'm lucky for, with that, that everything was smooth. I've heard a lot of divorces happen in the last year. Yeah. Um, that didn't happen here, not yet. But <laughs> I always saw it, not yet. But um, yeah, no, I think it, I've had my ups and downs just like anyone else. I, I'm more concerned about other people in my life, about how they've dealt with it. You know. This is, I didn't expect we were, first of all, God bless you. I'm so sorry to hear about your father. Thank you. Um, and if this is too touchy a subject to talk about, just let no, me know, move on of it. That's something you and I have in common. Uh, my father lived well into his 90s, my mother well into her 80s. At the very end, they both had their issues. Uh, uh, the, the mind's always the one thing that goes first oh, in I'm many so circumstances. So yeah. uh, I was lucky to not only, my younger brother lives here in Vegas too, so he moved in with them for a little while, but I was juggling you know, taking care of my wife who was sick, my yeah, my day so job at the time and trying to help them. It, it was really rough. But since my parents had passed, my my sisters are both my sisters are very spiritually uh, sensitive, intuitive. Nice. So but they used to tell me we know how they know how hard it, it hit me to lose them. But I'm they so said, sad. don't conjure them. Don't let them rest in peace. Don't conjure them. If they want to come to you, fine, but don't conjure them. So I never did. But someone plays with my hair all the time, and I know that's my mother. She did that all my life growing up. Oh, she's with you. She right just now. play with my hair, <laughs> and yeah. my father, <laughs> he comes to me in dreams, and I, I had a weird dream about him. Well, I used to get this, I get launched out of bed by this somebody shooting a gun, like somebody really walk into my house, put a gun by my wow. head, <laughs> shoot it off. It would launch me out of the bed, but. My wife doesn't wake up. My mastiffs don't wake up. I'm like shaking because it was so loud and real. Yeah. And after that happened mm. a few times, I realized um, I when I went to, this started happening before his funeral. And then I went to his funeral and they gave him a 21 gun salute. Oh, so wow. that's, that's what I figured that was. But then it's happened since. So I know, okay, I get it. Uh, this, is my, this is my sign for you. But I get this weird dream. It's He looks happy, but there's this long, dark road. It, it, it's not a, a desolate dirt road, but it's just a um, like a regular street. It's at night, but it's a, there's street lights and some homes, but you know, no cars. And it's at night, and I'm walking, and there's side streets. And as I get one or two blocks before this one street, I see him walk out mm -hmm. and make a right. And now I'm following him. <laughs> for a little bit finally i go hey dad he stops turns around sees me walks back to me i mean we get face to face yeah it is it is real and i go what are you doing are you lost and he says to me <laughs> he with that sm smile maybe i am Aww. and then i wake up but i yeah, i've never and that's happened a few times 
Yes. And um, uh, and I know he's not. He, uh, I know he's with my mom, and they're both doing well. But that's that's an interesting dream. A lot of people. Uh, I'm not a good dream interpreter, but I so I just <laughs> let it happen. What it is. I mean, it's I don't get the spidey senses that. Uh, I should take something ominous from that dream. Not, op- not ominous. It's actually very pleasant. I'm not um, a dream interpreter per se, but my aunt and my mother were, and my aunt's still alive, but she's, she's in a home now um, with dementia. And she used to say to me that if you see a past loved one in a dream and you chase after them and you call them out, if you're not following them, you're still alive. If you're following them, chances are you're crossing over. And, <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> the only uh, times I followed my mother, I'm like, what? <laughs> so, you, you just shocked it, it, me there for a second because I am in this dream. Well, not at first. I'm yeah, just walking. No, and no. then he comes out. But I end up for a, for a small bit of time following him. Yes, but he stops you and says, yeah, maybe I am lost. My <laughs> aunt would say that you are safe. That he's stopping you from from you know premature crossing over, huh. so to speak. Very it's a, it's just a, the culture, the way the Italian culture works on how they see things. Like I would always before my mom passed away. I was twenty seven when I lost my mom. My mom had me at forty, so she was sixty six. It, it you know she just was in ready to turn sixty seven when she passed away, and um, I. I dreamt of the year before of my dad passing. I was so afraid because he was a year younger than her wow. that he would not reach retirement because he always talked about it. And I knew people who passed away just before his generation, really hardworking, you know, where they had two and three jobs as we were growing up. We didn't really see our fathers because they were working so hard. They came here with nothing. And my mother said to me, what happened in the dream? And I said, well, Ma, I walked up to his casket and I was sobbing uncontrollably, uncontrollably. And I could see him. And what stayed so relevant in my mind was his arms crossed. I knew he had passed the way he was placed in the casket. How clear that was to me was horrifying. And she said, that was the best gift you could have given him. (laughs) What do you mean? She said, you extended his life. I'm like, what? She said, you extended his life. My mom ended up passing away 18 months later. And my dad lived to 90. Is that is a, that is a miracle, know, you know? Pretty, that's pretty dead on. So, yeah, you know, um, he... You know, you're he lucky because so life. many spouses don't last much longer after their, their, the love of their life crosses it, over, you know? What happened was three years after six years after my mom passed away. So my dad, his, he has three brothers, all but one buried their three out of the four buried their firstborns, which was devastating, oh. you know, to see our uncles at these funeral homes was so heartbreaking because they just, you know, sobbing, why couldn't it just be us? Why are they passing away? And they were all under 50. My cousin was 36. My brother was 51 and my other cousin was just over 50. So, you know, um, it's just, it's just, how do you explain that? You know, it, I don't know. Well, listen, this is what I want to ask you. I, something, I, I really feel that I got a message from who I don't know, probably somebody on your side of the family, um, to talk to you about your family, because in the short bio you have on your website, uh, I well, let me start this way. I get sent documentaries all the time, and this week I happen to get sent two documentaries mm-hmm. on exorcism of all things. Love it. Um, I don't know why <laughs> somebody would send me a documentary on exorcism. Um, both were entirely filmed in Italy, and when I started watching the documentary and realized where it was filmed, I immediately thought of you. That was the first one. Then later on, when the second documentary I went to watch, mm-hmm. also filmed in Italy, um, and I thought of you again, I'm like, I yes. have to ask you, and I had just read your bio, mm-hmm. I have to ask you about your great-grandmother, that village, her history with that, because that is, that's just like really, 
I mean, not everybody has that type of family history. And I oh, find it on both sides of crazy. Thank you. It's, uh, you know, I've, because of who my father's family is, it was very easy to trace the roots because it's in history. They built Pisa. It was so easy to go back in time. I went all the way to 647 wow. AD to find a composer and a musician, and they were always artistic in some way, which is funny because my dad played seven string instruments without ever being taught, including the violin and the cello, not the cello, sorry, the mandolin, which is the most difficult string instrument to play. And, uh, you know, it runs in the family, but they're artists, but I can't draw, but I do sing, but so does my mom. Anyways, my mother's side, wow, my great grandmother, the reason why there's so little on there is because I've been sort of tossed for even putting it there. I couldn't believe that after all these years, putting that on my bio would cause a rift between myself and some living family members wow which my mother's brother said to me ignore it because they're still in the village he's he's been in milan since he was like 15. he said it's a different way of thinking you know he was a deacon let it go forgive blah 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 you know the what we should be doing <laughs> really and um i that's why there's so little of it there but i didn't find out a lot of things about my grandmother till later on in life my mother kept that quiet. So I would hear little things. And I remember things like when I was sick, she would say, oh, my grandmother made this. Or my grandmother put this together, you know, using herbs and always natural. And I'm like, well, your grandmother sounds a lot like a holistic healer to me. Like, <laughs> wait a minute, right? Well, that back then wasn't seen as holistic healing. It was seen as witchcraft. So it was a whole other thing. It literally was that whole strega syndrome, that whole story, that, you know, that stereotype. And my mom said, you know, there was this black cloud for the longest time. My dad told me more about things when my mom had passed, because, of course, it was safe for him then. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, and then my aunt, my mom's youngest sister, Elizabeth, was very, very open about it. She didn't care so much as what they thought. And I always said she was the feisty one. You know, she was, I don't know, just different. And um, she said, you should be proud of what you can do and what you're doing and, and use this gift from God to do only good. And you will never be seen in a dark way, which is not true because I've lost a lot of friends. But um, yeah, my, my grandmother was one of those people who couldn't go to church after and didn't, but all, but whenever anybody was sick, or anything was going really bad, they all sought her out, which is kind of the way I live. Yeah. So it's not that different. That's amazing. Have you? Uh, how often have you been back there? I only went the one twice. I went twice. I how never felt comfortable in Italy. You, I'm not going to lie. Oh, really? Never really? felt comfortable there. Sometimes I wonder if I have a piece of her in me. I I'm comfortable everywhere outside of the village. I am not comfortable in that village. And I wow, always said yeah. to my father, I wonder if there's a piece of her in me because he goes, well, blood is blood. You yeah. have the DNA. I said, yeah, but I always wonder because I'm the only one, everyone's gifted on my mom's side, but I'm the only one who does the work that I do. I don't think that they couldn't if they tried. I just feel that they just didn't choose to. Not that they're any less gifted, nothing like that. Just I'm the only one that, you know, pursued it, which is funny because my great grandmother had that kind of spirit as well. So, That's very interesting. Do you get um, having the gifts that you have? Do you get much uh, loved one visitation or even ancestral visitation? Uh, yeah, uh, it, you do. Oh, absolutely. Started with with her <laughs> and my <laughs> grandmother. Yeah. Started with both of them when I moved out of Toronto and I got married and I moved here um, in, in Stony Creek, I was constantly having, I was home alone and I was in the main floor. I moved an hour away, so I didn't have my job. I didn't have any friends. I didn't know anyone here. And I would hear footsteps going back and forth, back and forth over my head, which would be from the master bedroom to the front bedroom, the master bedroom to the front bedroom. I'm like, what the heck is going on? And I had all those signs that you have in Anthonyville the flies and they would say oh no it's it's because you just built 
so they're in the house really the house walls everything's been closed for a year like why yeah. is this happening you know the infestations the sounds the the scratching and the inside of of the walls they tell me oh it's mice we live in the country you were just built everything had a reason explain to me why when i brought the priest over that he didn't leave the front carpet of my entrance to bless my house explain that one to me tell me that's because of construction <laughs> tell me that's because of building <laughs> yeah. right why and i said to him well father come upstairs and he's like no no amelia i could do it from here like, he didn't know me from a hole in the ground because the the parish that i belong to i went to ask and he wouldn't come so i went to a different parish where my friend went introduced myself and he came the next day and he said and i swear he's gifted he said to me you are like me and i felt like i had to help you i'm looking thinking does he have anxiety that's what i was thinking i wasn't thinking nothing clicked until he wouldn't step past that damn carpet and it really bothered me wow it really bothered me i'm I grateful that the priest that i originally asked to come in didn't come because i never i'm not gonna lie i never liked him <clears throat> excuse me sorry friday i'm always losing my voice because we've been <laughs> on air quite a bit by then yeah. um i didn't like him I, I remember shaking his hand and saying to my husband that i don't know but like i just saw the fires of hell and he's like wow. using it i go no i don't know i said there's so much darkness around him i don't like him there's something to do with children i don't like him and he said it's your imagination you're just upset because he wouldn't come yeah, it was upset, but not like that. Well, a few years ago, he got arrested. He's in prison for child molestation. Mm. You know, so mm. wasn't that far off. But um, yeah, I'm you grateful listen he to didn't your... come because I would have had an issue with that. <laughs> that who knows what would have happened if he came. Uh... Well, no, it, there's been other since because you can't rely on one blessing when you move into a house. That's what yeah. people who have that faith and that belief that I'm going to bless my house when I move in and I didn't know all the the steps of how you had to, you know, register as a parishioner. I didn't know that because I was born into the church that I belonged to before I moved here. And my mom didn't say anything, but I was going to church every every week. This was two years in. Why aren't you coming? And he said, you're not registered. You take my envelope. My name is on it. I'm there, you know, and it was really frustrating, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful that there was a sign there that no, we're not supposed to mix. So I'm glad. Absolutely. Who knows right. what what I would have picked up on him. Absolutely. Then. Yeah. But um, yeah, listen to your intuition. Listen to your. Absolutely. Job. I uh, I go to a bishop when I have issues, and he he's Filipino, mm -hmm. and he's much older than I am. He should be retired, but he he totally dis he is like, totally against what I do. Oh, uh, everything, exorcisms, okay. uh, uh, being in the paranormal. And so it's very uh, humbling and extremely humbling and, and grounding for me to go uh, to see him and have him just beat up on me about that. <laughs> um, and I can't tell you how many times I go to uh, homes where the people have already called. They go to a local parish near them. Uh, or diocese near them, they ask their priest to come out and do blessing. There's been issues. Yeah. He doesn't go much further than just your house and property blessing. So they reach, somehow they end up finding me. He, how many times I've driven up to those houses and the priest is outside actually either in his car or just kind of hanging around the front yard waiting for me to show up so we can just talk, but they oh, won't, wow. they don't go in. Oh, wow. And that's okay. Some people, you know, uh, maybe one day I'll find out uh, in a real sobering way that I shouldn't be. Maybe I haven't ran into the mother load of, oh, I, I of demonic you. haunts yet. God, God bless. I hope and, you don't ever. Um, yeah, I hope I don't either. But I hope, uh, we, I hope Michelle and I don't ever. Although I think Michelle has. You can ask her that next week. I think she has. You know what I think? Um, some people who are close to me who have gone with me just for moral support, if I just said, you know, for some reason, I just feel like uh, someone should be there to witness this uh, mm -hmm. other than just the family. And I have people that have known me for many, many years say, you know, you change. 
uh, when you go to these places and do this, you become something else. So what I, what I, and you're like fearless. And what I think happens is, and many times I get done doing whatever it is I've, I've just done in a place. And there's like time lapses where I don't remember everything that happened. And I'm thinking it's just part of my discernment, channeling the Holy Spirit and whoever else comes through. Cause I know I don't have any magical powers. I don't, I'm not the one actually doing anything. I'm, uh, I'm I mean, being used I as a either. vessel. Yeah. Yeah. We're being used yeah. in a good way. Yeah. And, um, so, uh, I go with, I look at it that way. I just kind of let go, let God and, Absolutely. and do what I gotta do, but we're both definitely created to do what we're doing or we wouldn't be doing. It. And I've lost many friends too. It is, is it that's what I want to ask you about because I get people reach out to me all the time. And it has something to do with children also. I know you deal with missing children. Love children. That has to be heartbreaking. <laughs> I couldn't it, do it. It's very, I, and you know, I didn't think I could either, but when I was younger, um, a relative of my mother's lost her child to abduction and he was molested and tortured for a few days and then dismembered. And I was about 18. So I had to, I had to see it in a different light. Unlike people who watch it on the news when it's in your face and you're only 18, think about 18 years old back when we were 18. It's not the 18 of today. It's not the social media. This is horrific. This is horrific on any day. Back then, you're talking about 10 and 12 year olds that were on buses by themselves, public transit. Everybody knew everybody in the neighborhood, you know, and he was taken at knife point from a shopping center. Nobody stopped the person taking him. And he was only 11 years old. So I, I looked at my mom and I said to her, I go, with all that I can do, how the hell did I not see this? You know, it was just one of those things. Why didn't, and I did say, why didn't God tell me? Why didn't someone who died tell me where he was? You know, maybe we could have stopped this. Like you, stay, you start to take that responsibility on. Yeah. And, you know, and then I got, I was really, really afraid and I put it off for a while and I've had several NDEs and finally it was just like, you can't do this anymore. I used to, it's so funny because I used to grow up wishing I was psychic. Not so much anymore, <laughs> but um, I used to wish that I could do things like that, not knowing that I could. I would always hope. I always just thought I had really good intuition. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just good at picking people off or, you know, it just, it was like a knowing I didn't, I didn't realize till I got, as I got older. What do you find the, uh, the, the, the main reason why most of these children are abducted? Is it um, just to be murdered? Is it just to be sexually abused and then murdered? Is it to put into the uh, human slave racket? What, what oh my is gosh, all of the above. But the whole thing is you have to look at age groups and first and foremost, the most, the abductions, <laughs> more than 60 to 70% of the time are done by the other parent, done by a parent. Um, those are custody battles and, and things like that. You know, um, I had one case where a nurse took a newborn from the house after a week of it being in the hospital because she had lost a baby that week. And she shot and killed the mother and took the six week old baby and wow. we had to track this baby down all the way to Texas. Like it's just everything is different. I do a lot of work with sex trafficking only because of my ability to remote view and that it, if it helps, I'm going to do it. But I do need to be on it within reason. It can't be a cold case because I we'll have to rewind everything and start over. When I work cold cases, I start it almost like law enforcement. I will put pictures all over the wall and I will start, you know, stringing and reading each and every photograph of everyone involved or anyone that was not necessarily involved in the crime, but even around the victim that day or the weeks before. It takes time when yeah. it's a cold case. It's really hard. The energy isn't prevalent. You cannot pickups per se like breadcrumbs are not the same just like anything um the first four hours a child is missing are so vital there's a reason for it that you know the trail goes cold it does for us as well so the sooner i get it the better it is and sometimes if i can't 
I will send it to someone else. I will always make sure that someone has them. I've always had a mediator and I don't have that group. I'm not with that group anymore because working with Michelle is a whole other story. So I'm only, I only take cases that are what we call hot within the first 24 hours to 48 hours. I'll take them and I'll work them as long as I can. And um, sometimes that means working with the police and sending them on a trail to find these other people. And sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's recovery, which is really sad. But yeah. I find that in the ages, for one thing, a lot of people misunderstand and believe that because they have boys, they don't have to be concerned. Let me tell you, this is not a sexually precious <laughs> crime. Yeah. Okay. If you, you, first of all, they will, boys are abducted all the way up to about eight, nine years old, sometimes older, you'll have them sex traffic when they're abducted young. They're literally put in containers. If people know what containers are that go on cargo ships and shipped out. And I won't say, well, this is one country is Thailand, but they, they're shipped out east because it's actually legal to prostitute them. Wow. So that's one type. Slavery is another type. If you look at the highway, the series of the 400 highways in Canada that stretch out and start from the far east and go all the way down along Ontario, Quebec, Ontario, and go through Buffalo into the U.S. and then all of a sudden it becomes I-95 and the 95s take down all the way to Texas, you're going to find a trail of children that are being prostituted in these hotels that are along these highways in these interstates. That's where they are, a lot of them. And they transport them from state to state so they don't have any trouble and they change vehicles. There's a lot to it. So it, it's a lot of, you can't just go by reading a photograph. You have to understand the crime as well so that you know what you're looking for, not just a picture of the child. I think it's really important to do the research on sex trafficking and, and where you want to put your, if you have the ability and you want to work this, there is always spaces open. Just make sure you find a group that's credible and has integrity, which is hard. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Police officers will not take your word for anything. And if anything, a lot of times the mediums become suspect. So you have to be careful. You need a media. I was just about to say that I wish, well, one thing, you know, I, I, I know that all these people that are responsible for doing all these horrific things are going to have judgment one day. Having said that, I wish that more law enforcement was widely more acceptive or ex accepting of psychics i would like to see a truly gifted psychic like you in every police station as just part of their weaponry in battling you know crime mm -hmm. um and i don't know why after all of this time in the year 2021 it's not more widely accepted i know many detectives that have told me oh yeah well, well it's just like anything it's like undercover cops have their snitches um, um uh, but the, some detectives have their they're on the side behind the scenes psychics that they go to and talk to and they don't let their their co-workers know about it because you know uh i don't believe that completely <laughs> um you what you have to understand is that sex trafficking is better than drug trafficking because they don't have a product to transport they can't be caught with anything and if they are they're in and out they're bailed out right away and the charges are usually dropped or they get a slap on the wrist. Wow. This doesn't start at the bottom. It starts at the top. Really? So this is not something that is that easily done. Um, for a long time when I did this work, um, I knew a man named Bishop Bailey. And if you look him up, he's in hiding now. He was a one percenter who worked with, um, was in prison, found God, worked with the FBI, went back undercover. Hmm. And I have his books. And um, I interviewed him several times, and he's underground now because he's got so many hits out on his head. Because yeah, he, when you say 1%, you mean biker? Yeah. And yeah. he was 
Oh my gosh. Part of one of the biggest takedowns in history, not long ago. So he had to go into hiding and he was always with a mask and always with, you know, secured and everything like that. And I, I interviewed him about five, six years ago with Bobby Brown when I, when I was working with Bobby and um, brought him on the show and he's an incredible man. And he will tell you there is way too much corruption. You can bring on a million psychics. It won't make a difference. They'll start pegging them off. You have to be very really? careful in this industry. You cannot. Oh. I left it a long time ago because a long time ago, for me, it feels like a long time. It's only been three years because I started working malevolent hauntings with Michelle and putting my gifts towards trying to save children in a different way. Um, it was, it wears on you as a psychic. That's why we need so many people on a team because it's always the same three, four people that are responding because everybody has lives, right? So you give this time. I was working 24 seven. I was on call 24 seven for almost seven years. That's a long time to be on call and to look at crime scene photos. And for all the children that came home, yes, there's quite a few. I don't give the number because it's not about that. Um, but I look at how many were rescue and recovery and that's heartbreaking and it's really hard. I made the biggest mistake of working with directly with families first, which was the biggest mistake I could have ever made, especially with broken families, divorced couples. It was her, it was just crazy. It was so intense and, um, not fair to everyone because you're, you're in the middle kind of thing. It's so important to get a mediator to protect you. I stayed anonymous for a long, long time. You will not see my name on certain cases that I have worked. You will never see my name in Canada to protect my own child. Absolutely. You'll never see my name on a case. I've worked behind the scenes, but you'll never see it. Um, there's a reason for it. There's a lot of reasons. And you have to be able to trust law enforcement that you're working with as well. I'm in direct contact with law enforcement here only because they happen to be friends. That's the only reason why. But I would never go especially in Canada, it's not as accepted. I think the U.S. is more accepting of it than Canada is. You know, you have to find the right Very person, but you have to remember that sex trafficking goes to the top. It goes to politicians. It goes to so much higher than politicians, country leaders. Um, and I'm not talking about political leaders. Think about it. So there's a lot to truth to that those conspiracy theories that I won't mention right now, because sometimes they get fed the wrong way and they, they just, they don't come out of the benefit of the children that are missing, but you know, it really does have a lot of truth. There's a lot of truth to that. It's heartbreaking. It's amazing to see you now where you're at. And I can imagine uh, the young girl, Amelia. <laughs> um, what, where do you feel your uh, information is coming from? If it's, is it some type of source energy? Is it spirit guides? Is, and when did you realize, when did you finally say, this is more than me just having good intuition? Um, <laughs> Probably my first NGE, <laughs> my 20s. Um, I kind of knew what was going on. And then it's funny because my entire life, I've had two readings by by psychics. I've never been one to want to partake in that. And it's hilarious because I will give people messages in a heartbeat. Um, they would all say to me, both of them have said to me, you're so highly gifted. I can't penetrate that wall. Can you take it down so I can talk to you? And I'm like, what are you talking about? So it was one of those things. I didn't know how to use it. I knew I had a gift because my mother, I, first of all, I would have to say in my teens when I attempted suicide, and I've talked about this, openly on our show on the outer realm with michelle because it's important that back then you have to understand we didn't have the internet we didn't have paranormal shows on tv i was growing up and going to school as a roman catholic it was different i had no one to talk to i was hearing things and i thought i was losing my freaking mind i couldn't fit in i felt so different i was afraid to talk about anything to do with paranormal with any of my friends because then they weren't allowed to talk to me anymore. It was hard. So I, I, I attempted suicide twice in 10 wow. months. 
and do that anymore oh my gosh no 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 but it was a different time you know and yeah. and that's when i realized because my mother sat you have children me. i'm sorry to interrupt i have you. a yep. daughter yes i have a daughter who's 24 i'm very proud of her and she's um is she gifted uh yeah doesn't want anything to do with it <laughs> doesn't want anything to do with it i always say well it's the reason why you're so successful in life i'm just saying but it it's, she's um she has her own agency she's pr and she works with nhl players so she's doing really well i'm proud of her she's a good kid you know but no she doesn't want anything to do with it if i'm if all of a sudden i just stop and i'm looking at something she'll just look at me and go what what was that what are you looking at you know and i just laugh nothing nothing and i clear it <laughs> i it wish i wish it wasn't the way you just explained it and it was similar for me and it is similar for just about everybody i talked to growing up with some type of psychic gift what yeah. I, for all of the parents out there i i don't have any children not that i know of um <laughs> for all of the and you being a parent and the relationship you had with your mother and knowing your family history and how you grew up for all of the parents out mm -hmm. there whether they're gifted or not, but suspect that they have a child that's gifted. Um, what advice do you have for them on how to approach this? Um, this they situation? can call me. I do mentor children. I love helping because there is an age where it's okay to answer questions. And I always say, handle it like sex ed. You only answer what they need to know. They don't need the whole story. So don't ignore them because my mother did that. My mother made me feel like I was going crazy and that if I told anybody, they would put me in a straitjacket and I wouldn't be able to have a normal life. That's how I was made to feel for a long time. My own brothers didn't know much about what I was going through because there's such a big age gap between us. When I call it coming out, of the closet so to speak one knew the other two were just like what is going on with you like what are you talking about when did this you know like those kind of questions i'm like well you know this happened and i don't know mommy didn't tell you <laughs> like it was one of those like a little like we were little kids again you know like i was a little kid again um i it's important to listen to what they have to say and sometimes it's just curiosity don't assume that it's a gift and if you're having trouble, contact Michelle and I. We take on cases. We help everybody. We don't charge either. You know, you can contact the outer realm. It's called the outer realm contact at gmail.com is the email. Cool. And Michelle will look at it. If you're looking for a mentor, make sure they're credible. Make sure they have integrity. Don't just go to anybody. Never pay for it. I'm going to tell you that right now. Never pay for it. If you have any questions, you can contact me go on my website, my, there's a contact there for emails, and I will be more than happy to help you. And if I can't help you, I will find someone who can. And I always will, because I don't ever want to see a child go through, not what I went through, because I don't know if that would happen. I pray to God it doesn't, but I think it's a little different. I think they'll get into trouble now because of the internet and because of the yeah. paranormal shows. The things that we see that are so common right now are phone apps. Pay attention to your children's phones. They can have a Ouija board on their phone. They can have an EMF detector on their phone. Simply just recording, you know, and communicating is an invitation. Yeah. Understand it. Do your research before you speak to them. And never, never, ever, ever, ever tell them it's nothing. Never. You know, I happen to watch have out your for imaginary para... friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I happen to have your paranormal partner in crime showing up here next yes. week. Yes. So yes. Be, my be bestie. Fun. Tell everybody yes. about that show, the nights that they can listen to you and oh, where wow. they can listen to it at. Yeah. It, it's it's so funny because it started off. She'll let, she'll tell you all about that as a QA between her and Jack Kenna. And I was actually the person behind the scenes just producing. And then Jack um, said he was a better guest than he was a host. and He didn't want to do it anymore. And Michelle asked me to be a part of that. And we have been going strong. We will be hitting our 200th episode in January. We do two wow. shows a week. We're on Wednesday and Thursday nights. It's called The Outer Realm with Michelle DeRoche and myself. 
Amelia Pisano, and we're on United Public Radio. You can find us on our Facebook pages. We're on all streaming platforms. And I'll let you I'll let her tell you about the shows that she does outside of the shows that we do together. And we also do a paranormal panel on Mondays for the network with all the hosts of the network. So well, you can cool. join in there too. Yeah. That's we're also on cool. StreamYard, which is really great. We love this. We love StreamYard. Uh, when yeah. are we gonna get uh oh my gosh, I mean it's you probably have to do more than one because if you do one and try and cram your life history into it, it's going to look like war and peace. Can we expect <laughs> a bit of a literature in the future <gasps> from you? Oh, I have a, the person who wrote my bio is one of my one of my closest friends, Corinne Champagne, and she is a writer. You would love her. You would love her. She wrote an inspirational book called That Moment. It's all based on short stories, true life experiences have to read that book you'll love it Very she's cool. been bugging me for the longest time i think i'm just not i don't have enough in my life for that i don't i don't think anybody would want to read it to be honest I just, oh <laughs> i thought the same thing too but yeah. spirit my I, it was spirit was making me your life and, is interesting <laughs> well i had to do it i had, they were yeah. on me to do it and yeah. i could not do it be you know i went years and years and years fighting it finally i said the only way i'm going to get them to back off and shut up get out of my head is to just do it um, yeah i don't even do i don't even do interviews you know I, there was something about you that i really liked and i asked michelle about you and she's like he's such a nice man you have to do well i'm going to okay. start introducing myself as the fabulous fellow the I fabulous like fella yes <laughs> the fabulous fella i know what i want to ask you it has nothing to do with with the paranormal sure you're italian yep. um pisano <laughs> yes uh, do you like pizza? Oh my God, it's my world. <laughs> oh my God, I, my like wife has had me on, on my timeline. Well, I, my my wife has had me on Nutrisystem the past month. I just got just when I was thinking I'm going to get a little break. My month two supply shows up. I'm like, geez, but uh, yeah, that is my that is my. Uh, there's uh, a cheat date on everybody's diet. I live uh, for the most part by keto, and you cook I it. Do... Can you cook? Oh my God. I, my father, I'll tell you, my father wanted me to be a chef. He worked for, he was the right-hand man for Isidore Sharp, uh, who is the Four Seasons Hotel. I grew up under, under their wing, so to speak. And Max Sharp was the person that hired my dad. And then my dad worked with Isidore and I never knew who they were till I was in my twenties. I just thought that those are dad's bosses. I went swimming at their house and that was it. Um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he wanted me to work because I would have been guaranteed a job. I would have been guaranteed a position. But again, we're talking about a time where when I was in my late teens, which is when I would have, he wanted to send me to Halifax, Nova Scotia has Culinary Institute there of Canada. And I didn't want to because no one was in the field. Then a woman was not in that field. Really? You, there were few and far in between the first female executive chef in the four seasons was Lynn Crawford, which is she's on all over to, um, Food Network now on many shows, especially in Canada, because she is Canadian. She was the first one and she's very well known and incredibly gifted. I hate cameras, I have a very thin skin. And um, I don't know if you've ever been in a professional kitchen. It's not far from Gordon Ramsay's world. I would, and I spent a lot of time in those kitchens because my dad's office was at the hotel. So I would, on a Saturday, if he had to go in, my father was in charge of building. And on a Saturday, if I, he had to go in, I would go, of course, as a little girl to the pastry kitchen. I was going to the other one. It was a lot quieter. <laughs> it was a lot quieter. And that's where my dad wanted me. I'm, I love to cook. I feel like I'm it's loving very, people. The when best cook. cooks are very spiritual soulful yeah. people are they and, yeah uh, yeah and i can see that in you and what okay th let's just break it down in the short amount of time we have left sure give us a couple of keys because i i i i would never make a homemade pizza and, and <gasps> it's even so a, easy well i do <laughs> but i mean i would never make one and put it up against yours oh no but you could i could what? give you a recipe and yours would taste exactly like mine give us give us the the keys to a knock your socks off homemade pizza authentic pisano pizza 
that you'll never want to go out and get Domino's or pizza. Oh God. Bed. Anybody who's eaten my pizza doesn't want to go out. I don't want to go out. Um, rest the dough, double zero flour, get yourself a really oh, good. Oh, I don't have any notes here. I'll send you the, I'll send okay, you the recipe. Okay, please, please. And Naples. I have a recipe for dough from Naples, Italy, from an award-winning pizza, oh, no, pizza no, maker. No. Neapolitan and style? Yes, very oh. much. And you know what is a really good trick? with the oven um you can get it at amazon it's called a pizza steel you don't have to buy a wood burning oven it's called a pizza steel you put that in your oven and you season it like you do cast iron but it's not as complicated to keep clean and it gives your pizza a charred look on the outside and it cooks it raises the temperature of your oven so when you put it to 500 it's really like 600 which is a pizza oven is between six and, and eight sometimes nine depending if it's wood burning and it comes out the same. And this dough can be made ahead of time and kept to slow rise in your fridge for days. I'll send it to you. Really? <laughs> yes. Toppings, it's the favorite best. toppings. Minimal, minimal. Fresh minimal. tomatoes, strained tomatoes. And if you can, you want to get muti. They're in a bottle, glass bottle. You can get them on Amazon in the States. I'm well aware of it. And um, a really good mozzarella, high fat. Don't put your basil on until it comes out later. The less is more in Italy. We do not... If you see a lot of toppings on a pizza in Italy, it's because you're in a tourist attraction. It's not, <laughs> it's not authentic. So yeah. it's like a, so I'm thinking Neapolitan style. It was uh, Margherita. Was, was that Margherita? Okay. Yep. For the Queen Margherita. That is my absolute favorite uh, pizza. You take the pureed tomatoes and they have to be from Italy. I'm not going to lie. They have to be. Muti is the best, the highest quality standard. It's not expensive. Pureed tomatoes straight on the dough. Just one ladle on a 10 inch. You don't need a lot. Some a little bit of sea salt and you you plop your fresh mozzarella or your mozzarella high, high fat. Okay. It's important. Mm. Not like six minutes, super, super thin, six minutes in the oven, take it out, and it's go time. It's my favorite food. Ask Michelle. She'll she'll tell you. You're it's crazy. Me here. I had a pizza night, just her and I one night, and she was dying. <laughs> you could do you could do a cook. I've even been asked my uh, my producer Adrian Hart is going to yeah. put together a cookbook. I yeah. sent her a recipe for my mother was Brazilian. Oh, the one, nice. the one killer Brazilian dish she taught me. I sent that to them to put into the book. I've yeah. thought about um, doing a cookbook. You've got to at least do one of those. That's Come what on. that's what that's what Corinne wants to do. Cooking with the psychic styles. I'm like, oh my god, Corinne, I can't. I don't have the. I would. I've been asked to do classes at my house. I don't have the measurement thing going. I'm very Cares. much old you know, school but you where know. I'm like, just feel it. You, just, and you, you, know, you speak it from your heart and say, I love you know, you stick your hand in the salt and grab a, a punch of it and boom. Yeah. Yeah, you, that's you what I want to read. I don't want to read get a quarter of this and an eighth of that. No, I don't want to read that. But the dough stuff. is a precise science. The dough is a science. Everything but, is way. What kind of dough is it? It's the Neapolitan pizza dough. But I also oh. make bread. I also do breadsticks. I do. I make everything from scratch right oh down gosh. to gelato. But it's a problem. It's why I have a gym in my house. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, how do you eat that way? You should see the mileage on my treadmill. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> we're, we're about to get cut off here. I love you. I respect you, you. I can't Thanks. wait to get the recipe. Yep, Did you have fun? You Will right you come now. back? Oh my gosh, I'll come every week if you want. <laughs> Thank you. You have a, a wonderful, fun. I'm going to keep you in my prayers, uh, your mother Thank and you. your father in my prayers. Um, Thank you. Uh, God bless you for spending an hour with me and my, and my uh, viewers today. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful remainder of your Friday evening and your Thank weekend. You, you too. If I don't talk to you before Thanksgiving, a wonderful Thanksgiving. Oh, we we've had ours, but a happy Thanksgiving to you. Ours is in October. Oh, very yeah. cool, very cool. Yes. I did not know that. Yep, thirty, almost sixty years before the U.S., it was a harvest dinner. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Amelia. God bless you. Have a wonderful you evening. Too. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you for having me. I know how to let myself out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you later. Oh. I learned something new every day. I didn't know they had Thanksgiving before us, and I can't wait to get that pizza recipe. And I'm going to put my foot down. My wife is the boss. I know that. But 
after two months of Nutrisystem, I'm going to start making some pizza again. All right, guys. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I know I say that a lot, but I mean it. Thank you to my beautiful, passionate, talented producer, Adrienne Hart, Ghost Granny, Desert Heart Paranormal. She's also a big wig at the PUN TV, Paranormal United Network. Thank you for simulcasting my show. Go there and check out their lineup on their Facebook Live page. Thank you to Things Network, my first episode being simulcast on the Things Network. Go there, check them out. Thank you to everybody. I'll be back next Friday the 12th with Michelle DeRoche, who is the paranormal partner in crime of Amelia's. So that show is going to rock live from New Orleans, one of my favorite towns on the planet. So that show is going to rock. Everybody have a blessed week. I'll leave you with this. St. Paul said, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Galatians. I love you all. Good night, Jack. Good night, dog. Good night, Harold. Rest in peace. Good night, Ernie. Good night, Bill. Good night, Dan. Peace. I'll be watching. Good night, everybody.